الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء أشرف المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد. So in the series that we've been having every Saturday when I'm in San Diego, um, discussing some of the most important personalities in history for us to know and benefit from. Today we're going to be discussing a Sahabi, a companion who has a rather unique background. And he has reported a very famous hadith, which we'll get into today. Uh, most likely we will not finish his biography today because there's a lot that people don't know about him. And the reason I chose him is uh, yesterday after Jum'ah, I had a phone call with some of the tulab in another country. And they were telling me about you know, different issues that they were facing and I was answering some questions. And one of them said, you know, we have a lot of the Sahaba that are Persian, like Salman al-Farisi and Tamim al-Dari. And I was like, Salman al-Farisi is Persian, but Tamim al-Dari is not. And this is a student of knowledge. I mean, this is somebody who studied at Islamic University. And he said, but Dari, like Dari, the language. I told him, no, no, Banu Dar was a Qabila of Lakham, which was a Qabila that was from what is today Palestine. He was from the land of Palestine. And he was shocked by it. He goes, I've always taken him to be Persian. And then it kind of put me at a, a, you know, a strange shock because I said, a student of knowledge who studied Islamic University doesn't know Tamim al-Dari is not Persian. That means we really need to know who Tamim al-Dari is. So I decided uh, late last night that I'm going to choose him as the person we're going to study today, inshallah. Uh, Tamim ibn Aws ibn Kharaja al-Dari is from a, a famous qabila called Lakham. Lakham is uh, an Arab tribe that is in what was Sham at the time. Today, what we take to be Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, and Jordan, all of this area used to be called Sham. Like today when we say Sham, it usually refers only to Syria. But that's not true in historic sense. The area of Quds is a very famous and blessed area, may Allah free it. And this is an area where many of the great ulema and a'imma came from, like the Maqdasis, you know, Maqadisa. When we see uh, Ibn, Ibn Qudama al-Maqdasi, Abdul Ghani al-Maqdasi, uh, Ziyauddin al-Maqdasi, this is from that area of Palestine. That area, in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Sham, were Arab, the Qabail, they were Arab, and they had aligned with the Roman Empire. The Arab, as we discussed on the eastern side, they had aligned with the Persian Empire. We discussed this in the last dars and the one before that. Here, because the superpowers were two at the time, the Persians and Romans. So those that were Arab, Qabail, closer to, like we discussed in the story of Sahib al-Rumi, closer to the Persian area, they aligned with the Persians and they would adopt their practices and cultural aspects and even in their Arabic language you will find a dialect that is closer to Persian. And in many of the countries even till today, like Iraq and the Khalij in these areas, they will use the word cha, bachir. Instead of saying tomorrow, they say bachir. Even though the cha is not an Arabic letter, it's the phonetics of the letter cha is not an Arabic language at all. But it is there in Farsi, and that influence came. And the Arab that were closer to the Roman Empire, on the western side, they would then align with the Romans, and they took on the religion that was enforced by the Romans, which was Christianity. And many of their dialects, you will find things that are closer phonetically to European languages than the pure Arabic language. Tamim ibn Aws, he was Christian in the sense that this is what the Arab tribes of Lakham and Banu Ghassan and others that we can talk about, they had adopted in line with the Roman Empire. But he was somebody who was always looking for the truth. And that's a very important aspect. When somebody comes from a Christian background or a Jewish background or atheist background, it doesn't really matter. And all of us come to different backgrounds. But when you look for the truth, when you're sincere in your seeking, that Allah will open a way for you. And when Allah opens the way, there are two types of people. Then. Those that accept that way, they humble themselves, they accept the truth and they follow it. And there are those who are stubborn and and it was for whatever political or tribal or nationalistic reasons, they leave that way. Tamim al-Dari was a person who was very soft-hearted. He was open to accepting the truth. 
So in the time where he explains himself and looking at the different ahadith from his own statements, I found three major reasons how he found the truth. And that's important for us because we want to be seekers of truth. Now, most of the Sahaba, they used to be idol worshippers before Islam. And the majority, because the Quraysh and the Arab and, and Mecca, it was an a area that was predominantly idol worshippers. A few of them were Jews before they accepted Islam. We will speak about some of them inshallah. And most of them were from Medina. And a few were fire worshippers. For example, Salman al-Farisi originally was somebody who worshipped the fire. And then of course he went through a phase of being Jewish and Christian and so on. Until he came to Islam. Tamim al-Dari is one of the few that was Christian before he accepted Islam. There are many others. But in comparison to the majority of the Sahaba, there are few. So he says himself that he went to a rabbi because in the area of Sham, where he was in that area, there were Jews and there were Christians. So he said, I went to a rabbi because I saw him dedicated to his books and I told him I want to become Jewish. So he went and he saw them and he went to learn and accept their religion. And he said, the rabbi told, told me, don't accept our religion. Don't come, don't become Jewish. Because we are a cursed people. This was a, this is the statement of the rabbi to him. And that's why many times when you see in Judaism, there's not much uh, preaching. Like they don't really try to convert people. Even myself, when I went to a, a, a temple to learn about the religion of Judaism, when I was very young, when I was searching myself, the first thing they told me is that you don't want to become Jewish. Uh, the same thing they told me. So he was surprised by this. So he told them why. Tamim al he asked the rabbi why. He said, because we are a people that didn't follow our message and the curse of Allah came upon us and we saw the next messenger that came, yani Isa ibn Maryam, and we didn't follow him. And we know that the last messenger is coming and we hope that he will be from our people so we can follow him. So Tanim al he took a very interesting lesson. He said, that, he said, this person knew the truth, but due to ethnicity. They did not want the, the last messenger to be Arab. They said, we'll accept him if he's from our people. Now this was before Tamim Madari knows anything about Rasulullah Muhammad But this set an idea in his mind that there is a last messenger coming in accordance to what the rabbi found in his own text. He said then, when the people of, when my people, they took the religion of Christianity, he said, I took this with them and I went to a priest to learn about Christianity, to learn more. He said this priest was Arab from their own people, but he had accepted Christianity in, a, in accordance to what the Romans had brought to them. He said, I asked that priest and that priest told me that what I found in my book is the truth was the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Now this is the priest telling him. He said the truth is what Ibrahim and as we know in the Judaic tradition and the Christian tradition and the Islamic tradition, we find the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam. He said, the truth is what Ibrahim was upon. And he said, now in this time, even though I'm following a religion, the people have changed it. Now the priest is telling him that the true message of Jesus has been changed by the priest of our time. And he says, now we know there will be a last prophet. Now according to the Jewish rabbi, he was given this message. And according to this Christian priest, he was given this message that the last prophet that has been prophesied is coming. And I hope when he comes that you follow him. And that was something that imprinted in his mind. The second reason which he gives himself, he says when we used to go to the deserted areas, the deserts and forests, areas where there was nobody, where there was no town, we would pray to jinn. Jinn is another creation. Many people don't understand what the jinn is. In the West and in the East and here and there, we hear about ghosts. You know? And nobody really understands. You know, there's sometimes people see, I felt something, I heard something, I saw something. And people give their own ideas that they're dead people whose souls are walking around and so on. And we know that when somebody dies, their life of this dunya ends and they enter the barzakhi life, the life of the grave. But what we do have is many times evidences. People that have seen, people that have video people that have that seen concepts that they couldn't quite explain. Islam gives that explanation. 
We are not the only creations on this earth. We are humans, yes, what we call insan or ins. But there are animals, there are fish, there are birds, there are other animals that also share this earth with us. And there are many creations that we cannot see with our eyes. Even as scientists, when they talk about dark matter and things like this, there are things we can't see. Oxygen, carbon dioxide. Yes, today as science, we understand that these elements exist from effects that we can feel. But if you went a thousand years ago and you told humans that there is oxygen, then they would tell you, prove it. <laughs> show it to me. You can't show oxygen. You can't touch oxygen, right? And now, there are scientific experiments we can do today to prove its existence. But at the time when humans couldn't see it or touch it, it still existed. We still would breathe it. It was still a necessary element for us to survive. Carbon dioxide, the same thing, right? Much of what we know today is through experiment of effects of things and then an explanation that we give to it. And there is much that we don't know till today. Science obviously has not discovered everything that there is to be discovered. So in Islam, in the Quran, in Sahih Ahadith, we have the concept of jinn. Another creation that is here, but they have their own world. And sometimes our worlds overlap. At times, even though we as Muslims, as humans should not indulge in their world. We should not try to contact them and deal with them. Nor should they indulge with us. They should live in their world and we should live in ours. But there are those who go into an evil path and sometimes try to indulge. And we have seen any uh, Christians and others have also talked about exorcism and jinn possessions and so on. And many of that has been documented in Western history as well. And you can look up Emily Rose and so on. Now here, Tamim al said we would reach out to these jinns to try to protect us against other jinn. So they would reach out and say, whoever is the big of the, or, or the strong or the, or the leader of the jinn for this area, offer me protection. And the jinn would. And this would be something that they would brag in. This was something that they would take honor in. Meaning, oh, look at these humans. I am so strong. They reach out to me and I give them protection. And they would flex on the other jinns not to mess with them. For example, today, and if you go to a place and you go to a king or a, or a rich person, you say, I seek your protection, I seek, then they feel like, yes, I'm somebody, you know, I can offer protection, right? So in the same way, they would deal with the jinn. So Tamim Madari himself says that I reached out to these jinn, but a voice spoke back to me that I could not see. I couldn't see anybody there. But a voice spoke to me and said, don't ask protection from shayateen, from jinn. Instead, you should ask protection from Allah. And that jinn said that we have gone and heard the last messenger recite Quran. And this is something that we have in the Quran. This, now Tamim al-Dari doesn't know that this is mentioned in the Quran. This is pre-Islam. But the Quran talks about the jinn that heard the Quran of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and they became Muslim. And from the jinn there are Muslims and there are kuffar. So this is one of the jinn that had become Muslim. He said to him, look, don't do this anymore. Instead of asking protection from shayateen and jinn, go ask protection from Allah. Because no jinn can protect you against Allah. And if Allah protects you, nobody can harm you. Now here, Tamim al when he heard about the last messenger, he said, it reminded me of what the rabbi and the priest had told me about. But till this time, he had not taken on the responsibility to go and actually seek the company of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa until a very interesting event happened. And this hadith is reported in the Sahih of Imam Muslim. Now this hadith is interesting in many ways. One of the ways is, usually a hadith are reported how? A Sahabi reports from who? From the Prophet And when you look at the books of Asani, you look at a tabi'i, he reports yani, from the Sahabi, for example. The Sahabi says, Qala Rasulullah sallallahu sallam, an Rasulullah sallallahu sallam, samiyat Rasulullah sallallahu sallam, meaning Rasulullah sallallahu sallam said, or on his authority, or I heard, and so on. So this hadith is interesting because Rasulullah sallallahu sallam reports something, and he tells us to listen to the words of a Sahabi. And then he confirms it. So that's a very unique thing about this hadith. Secondly, it gives us some news that is uh, unique that we find in this hadith. And before I mention the hadith, 
I want to explain this that the hadith is in Sahih Muslim. So no doubt to the Sanad of it. Imam al nawawi Ibn Hajar Asqalani, other Imam and Ulema, they reviewed the Sanid and they said no doubt that it's authentic. Because some of the people are weak Imam, then today they put doubts in the people's minds. One of the people who taught the seerah in, in the US, I'm not going to mention his name, and he taught about many of the Sahaba. When he taught this issue, he also put some doubts. And he said it was only reported by Fatima bin Qais, which is incorrect. Fatima bin Qais is the reporter in Sahih Muslim. But just to be clear, Abu Hurairah radiyallahu anhu, Aisha radiyallahu anhu, and other Sahaba have also reported it in the Muslim Imam Ahmad and other books of Hadith as well. So to try to put some kind of doubt like it only goes to the one Sahabi is incorrect. It's academically incorrect. Secondly, the ulema of Islam from the time of the Salaf till today have accepted this Hadith. No doubt. No need to try to give it any weird meanings and so on. Yeah? And this Hadith, the beginning of it, is interesting, but I'm going to go back to the actual text because we want to talk about the time before his Islam. But I'll mention the beginning where the Hadith in Sahih Muslim, Fatima bin Qais says that I heard the caller who Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi had assigned to announce for him say Salatul Jami'ah. Salatul Jami'ah would be a call that's made to collect the people. Some of the ulama said that was a statement that used to be made before Adhan, but what is correct is that Rasulullah sallallahu would make this statement occasionally just to the collect the people in other than the five times salawat. To collect the people other. So Fajr has its adhan. And there is two adhan for Fajr as you know. Muhar has its adhan. Asr, Maghrib, Aisha. These are the salawat that have adhan. Other salawat do not have adhan. Eid for example doesn't have an adhan. Huh? For example, Qiyam uh, al Witr, Taraweeh. These do not have adhan. Salatul Kusuf. They don't have adhan. Right? So the adhan, the adhan as we make is specific to certain salawat. But if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted to collect the people, whether it's for a special salah or for yani, a warning or a reminder, this was the statement that would be made, salatul jami'ah. And the people would rush. Fatima bin Qais says that when I heard this, I knew it was something important. So I rushed out of my house and I went to where the women would be and I wasn't the closest stuff to the men. In the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the women would start the sufu from the back, from the furthest and go forward. So she says, I was very close to so that I could hear what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will tell us. And here Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he prayed, he made a salah. And then he told the people, stay in your places. Meaning, don't go back, don't move. And then he told them, I did not collect you lil rughba or raghba, yani to give you an encouragement or rahba or to warn you. Like sometimes Rasulullah would collect the people and would, would tell them that there's going to be a battle or that some people are going to attack or he would give them a special instruction in the Sharia. But he said, today I didn't do that. Rather we have with this Tamim Ad-Dari who was a Christian and today he has come and he accepted Islam and I want you to listen to what he told me and I confirm what he said. Meaning this is not one of those things where it's from Israeliyat, where somebody from the earlier tradition said something. No, this is something that Rasul ﷺ confirmed. Tamim al-Dari, he explains now. Now this event happened before the beginning of this hadith. And this is the third event that brought him to Islam. But because the hadith mentions after he's already there accepting Islam, I mentioned it. He said, we sailed with 30 men. Now, so this is very important because some people, they say, oh, maybe he was confused. No, it wasn't just him. He sailed with 30 men from the Qabila of Lakham and Jud'an. These are again two Qabal that were in the Sham area. He said, we went out because they used to go out on the oceans. The Arab that were closer to seaports like the place of Palestine, Palestine, that's next to the ocean. They would go out and the Arab that would be more inland would not like it. Then the Quraysh, for example, they didn't like to go out and sail in the, in the ocean. They didn't like to go out. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa we don't have any hadith of him going out in the boats and so on. The Quraysh, very few of them. But the Arab that live by Yemen, for example, or the ones that live by Palestine and so on, they, would, they like to go out, they would fish, they would go, they would go to islands, they would go and trade and so on. So he said, we would go out and 30 men with us on a boat, we went out. And we got lost at sea. The ocean, it had, yani the, the waves were high. 
and we got lost to the point that we had no idea where we were. And 30 days we were lost. I mean, they went far. 30 days, a whole month, we were lost at sea. Now, exactly where did they go, we don't know. The hadith does not mention. And it's not upon us to guess. Right? This is one thing, again, you see a lot of people on YouTube or TikTok. No, no, they went to, like one guy, like they went to the UK. <laughs> where did you get that from? You know, just kind of made it up. Some people say the Bermuda Triangle. We don't know. The hadith doesn't mention, we don't guess at these things. But they said we were lost until we found an island. And because they were at sea, they said they went, they went out so far, it was the ocean water, salty water. So they couldn't drink from it. So they said that the water was salty, so when we saw the island, we hoped that there was fresh water, so we could bring some. So we took a smaller boat and we sent out to the island. And when we got to the island, we saw a Daba. Daba here, it's just, it's a beast, an animal, a large animal. And interestingly, when I was looking at the hadith, they use the female tense of the Arabic language. And many times it's really interesting when we look at, uh, and this is one of the problems why you should stay off like TikTok and these things, because they make these little videos and they show this big man and he's very hairy when they represent this hadith. But it, that, that's incorrect. Because they said when we saw this animal, it was very hairy to where we could not tell its front from its back. So it wasn't like a big hairy guy where you could see his face, like you know the little animation they made. That's wrong. Rather, they said it was an animal that we had never seen the like of. It was something that we had never seen. It was something unusual. And it was very hairy where we could not tell what it was, but it spoke to us. Yani in words that they understood. In the Arabic language. So the, we said, Waylaki. And, and the ka has a kasra, interesting. And because Daba is a female, is the type of beast. I'm not saying it was a woman either, right? I'm just saying it was an animal. So leave it at that. Ma anti said, what, what are you? So the animal replied, it, Ana jasasa. Jasasa comes from the word jasus or, or to spy or to get news. Jasasa here, people have thought as if it's a name. But most likely this is something that he was describing, that he's somebody who collects news for who? For who he's going to talk about. He said, I'm Jasasa. And the hadith is famous as the hadith of Jasasa. That's what the hadith became famous by. So they said, we became afraid of it. It's something that we saw as scary. I mean, not something normal. Right? So we asked him, what are you? So he said, leave that. Go to the man in a monastery. And it's interesting a dayr here in Arabic in the hadith refers to a monastery. Right? And there's something very interesting to me personally. Why? Because many people are waiting for the second coming of, of Jesus والسلام, of Christ. But many people may confuse who they're looking at. Right? And this is somebody who was in a monastery, not in a, just a house or so on. Right? So when the Tamim Adari and them, they heard this, they became afraid. And they said, we thought it was a devil, so we wanted to run from it. So we walked away. But when he told, me, told us to go to this monastery, we ran to it because we were afraid of it. So we ran away toward that monastery. He said, in that monastery, we saw the biggest man we've ever seen. But it was a man. He was large. But again, we don't want to exaggerate to be like, you know, as if he was like a building or something. No, but amongst humans, he was large. And he was tied up with his hands uh, to his neck and his legs were, bond, were bonded. So he could not move with iron chains. And we became afraid from him. So we said, I mean, woe to you, who are you? So he said, before that, he said, let me ask you some questions. Now, here... It's a very important part of the hadith. I'm going to mention some of it, but I want to really understand it as well. Here, we see some of the signs of the Day of Judgment that will be described. So, he asked them that there is a place called Baisan. Are there trees there? And we, being from the area of Sham, he said, we knew Baisan. We said, yes, there are trees there. He said, do they bear fruit? He said, we said, yes, of course. 
He said, soon a time will come that they will be barren, they will be gone, and they will no longer bear fruit. Now, regarding this hadith, when I was studying this particular hadith in Sahih Muslim from one of the shiuch in Pakistan, he told me that I met people from that area. And I actually Google mapped it as well. And there were a, a large amount of trees there that are gone today. And those people have confirmed that today, that area, the trees do not bear fruits anymore. Now this is something that didn't happen in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But it has happened in our time. And this is in the hadith of Tamim al -Dari. That the man who's here, we'll mention who he is, and some of you may have already figured it out. He said, this will happen, and that is a sign from the signs that my time will come. That the trees in that area will no longer bear fruit, and they will be scarce, they will be gone. And when they are gone, this is a sign that will come. This didn't happen in the time of Rasulullah But that prophecy came true. Like the other signs of the Day of Judgment that the Prophet has told us. Then he asked about a lake which is called Tabariya here in Hadith. And in the Western books, it looks like, and again, I want to do some more research on this, but I found this very interesting. Uh, Galilee area where there is a lake that today, and, and my Sheikh said this, and then I looked it up on Google Earth. It is at the lowest point in history. It's almost dried up. It used to be a huge lake that had a lot of water. Today they're expecting in the next few years it will dry up. So here, the Jal or the man here, he asked, spoiler alert, he asked, is there a lake there? They said, yes. He said, does it have water? They said, yes, it is filled. He said, a time will come that it will dry up. And that is coming true in our time. 1400 years. Then he asked about a spring of Zughar. And this is a place where uh, in, it's in South Syria. Now, what I have found is the spring of Zughar that was there in the old maps today is dried up. This is something that was mentioned there as well. And then he asked, has the prophet of the unlettered people come forth? And Tamim al dari he said, who is that? Yani he told him, is there a man that has come from an Arab people or unlettered? Meaning a people that are not sophisticated like the Romans and Persians and so on. Has a prophet come in their time? And here Tamim al said that I had heard from that jinn. And this is a different narration, not the one in Sahih Muslim by the way. And he said, when I had remembered that, I told him, yes, that prophet has come forth. So here the man said, has his, their people fought him? And he said, yes, the Quraysh, they fought Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And he said, what are the outcomes of those battles? Sir Tamim al-Dari said, sometimes they win and sometimes he wins, yani, because in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu for example, Badr was a clear victory. Oh, it was a setback and so on. And even though he explained it's not a loss, but yani, he would go back and forth. So he said that if they were intelligent, like if they won good, they would follow him because he is that last prophet and his coming is one of the signs of me being released and when i'm released i will go to every city within 40 days i will go out the whole world now, very interesting if you think about the time of sahaba they could not have imagined that type of travel like imagine in their time you would travel how horses camels ships you didn't have cars, you didn't have engines, you didn't have boats, you didn't have any of that. You had no, no idea of light speed, any of that kind of stuff. So imagine when the Sahaba heard that Dajjal would go around to every city within 40 days. It must have been mind-blowing to them. It was something that could not have been accepted by what they see in front of them. But this is Iman. This is Iman to believe in the ghaib. And they believed in it. Today we can imagine that. Today, when we look at travel, looking, we're trying to go to Mars, we're trying to look at speed of light, we're trying to, you, know, you look at a concord, we look at whether the technology is there today or not to actually fulfill that, but we can understand that, right? We can see how fast travel has become, and who knows how fast, how much faster it will become. So it's much easier for us to accept a hadith like that today than then, but the Sahaba accepted it, that was their Iman. And that is why when things like, 
يعني جعجوج مع جوج ركام. We shouldn't try to be like, oh, we've we've Google mapped the world. You know, we haven't. Much of the world we don't know about. And whatever is in the Quran and the Sahih a hadith upon us is to accept. Like the Sahaba, when they heard the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that the Bedouins would be competing and building tall buildings, they couldn't have imagined that. They didn't understand what a tall building was. I mean, at that time, and the, and the barefoot Bedouins, like those that had nothing, how would they be competing in building buildings? Today, when we go to the Gulf, and we see Burj Al Arab and Burj Dubai, and we see the, the Khalifa Tower, and this and that, today we see that hadith come true in front of our eyes. But we shouldn't at that time have said, well, I don't know, that, how would that happen? No. If it's in the Quran, in Sahih Ali, we believe in it. And then we see it come true in front of our eyes. As all the signs of the day of judgment will come true. Whether we're alive or not to see them is different. But they will come true. And how? We'll find out then. So here, this man then told them, I am Dajjal. I am that Antichrist. And that's very important because some people, because the weakness of Iman, they're like, Dajjal is a satellite, or Dajjal is the internet, or Dajjal is this. No, it's a person. Rasulullah Wasallam described him. He is a fitna that will come from Allah, from the side of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a test. And we know this will come. And from this hadith, we know that clearly Sahaba even saw him. Now, how could he be alive all that time ago and so on? Allah willed it. He is a test from Allah. Just like how he could build, bring people back from the dead in front of you, whether it's in the shape of jinn or so on, or show you a jannah or jahannam, by the will of Allah, that's a test. So now, Tamim al-Dari, and I'll talk about this hadith a little bit more in the next dars, inshallah. But Tamim al-Dari, when he explained this, and he said, we saw this when we were freed, when we got away, we immediately tried to get back to our land. And when we got back, I immediately set out to Medina. He said, this was enough for me with the other yani, signs that Allah had shown me to know this is the messenger of Allah. And he came to Medina with 10 people and they accepted Islam. And he did many amazing things. And he did many things that were first for the ummah. And inshallah, in the next dars, we'll go over those by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.